Hello, and welcome back to Holding Space for Therapists, the podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Cassidy Freitas. In today's episode, I am welcoming back onto the podcast my good friend, Dr. Michaela. You may remember Dr. Michaela from our last episode together where she shared with us the magic of copywriting using your words to reach your ideal dream client. If you have not yet, please do yourself a favor and tune in to that episode. In today's episode, we are taking a look at the world of podcasting and specifically pitching yourself to be a guest on another podcast and why this might be of interest to you as a therapist. In this episode, here is what we're covering. The reasons that we both believe that therapists make outstanding podcast guests some of the common myths that might be stopping you from pitching yourself and the surprising truth about each of these myths, insider tips from both of us to help you stand out as a dream guest to podcast hosts, and some simple steps that you can start to take today to prep for your first or your next podcast pitch. Here's the thing. Having a podcast myself has been a very powerful tool in my business for marketing my private practice as well as my other offerings. But I've been so surprised time and time again how being a guest on someone else's podcast is how my dream client or that customer found me. And I want you to have the same really powerful evergreen marketing tool in your back pocket and to feel prepared to not only pitch yourself, but to do the actual recording for somebody else's podcast. I am so glad that you are tuning in to today's episode. You are going to fall in love with Dr. Michaela, and you're going to walk away learning so much from her, and I think you're going to feel really empowered to, empowered to take the next step in utilizing podcasts as a marketing tool for yourself if that's something that feels aligned for you. All right, are you ready? Let's dive in. You're listening to Holding Space for Therapists, a podcast for modern therapists. I'm your host, Dr. Cassidy, and I'm passionate about supporting therapists in building profitable, sustainable, and meaningful private practices. Are you ready to build or grow your modern private practice? Let's dive in. Hello, my friend, Dr. Michaela. I am so thrilled to be connecting with you again and have you back on the podcast. I'm super excited for our topic today. But first, how are you doing? How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing well. Thank you. It's so good to be with you. It feels like just yesterday and also a million years ago, which is kind of the vibe these days. So yeah, Yeah. just grateful to be here with you. Real, like Yeah, a lot has happened since we last connected. The world looks like a different place Um, right Mm -hmm. now as we're recording this. It's September 2021. Um, My kids are back in school after doing a lot of distance learning last year, which is super exciting. I was just sharing with you that I'm in my husband's office today. I usually have been working from home, but we are, I'm starting to see more clients and opening up my schedule and needed some better Wi Fi and some more privacy. So I'm in the office today, which is exciting um, to be back kind of in a, in a work setting outside of the home and thrilled to be able to connect with you here on my first day back. So we are diving in today to the topic of pitching yourself as a therapist to podcasts. And so yes. you've you've been on the podcast before and um, you've shared a little bit of an intro there, but maybe you can introduce yourself again, a little bit of your background and context, the work that you're doing these days, and also share with us why this is a topic in particular that you are really passionate about. Absolutely. Thank you so much for for having me back. It's a treat. And yes, I know this is a topic we're both passionate about. And I think um, 
Yeah, I'll just, I'll dive right in. So I'm a licensed psychologist and a copywriter for health and wellness professionals. And I like to say my career closet's sort of packed with all the different hats I've worn in our field. I feel like I've done a little bit of everything. I've worked in academia. I've worked on research teams as a college professor. Um, I've consulted on policy work and interventions. And I've started and grown my own therapy practice. And through my experience doing that, built a side business that has now become a full-time business, supporting other health and wellness professionals in doing the same. So if I cut right to the heart of what I'm most passionate about these days, it's really encouraging and supporting other healers and helpers in really owning the responsibility and the freedom that they have to be a living, breathing representative of the work that they do. So everything from the words on their website to the tiniest little call to action in a social media post, it's all us. We are, at the end of the day, the best ambassadors of our own business. And so because we have to do that, but we're not taught to do that in our training, I feel like I sit right at the intersection of like, I'm weirdly passionate about it, but I'm also one of you. I understand we don't get background on this and we also don't have a zillion hours of the day to be diving into this work. And so I love equipping other health and wellness professionals to really um, hone their own skill because while it's true that we can outsource any number of pieces of our written communication, our copy, I believe at the end of the day, we need to be able to do all the day-to-day communications um, about our business with the people that we're trying to reach. Because ultimately, that's the point, is that being a skilled communicator is good for us, it's good for the field, and of course, it's good for the people that we most want to serve. And there's so many more like touching points, I feel like now as a therapist running a modern business, there's so many more touch points of communication with the communities that we are connected to. And, and maybe that's not the case. We're always communicating as a way to market our businesses and um, in the work that we are actually doing, but now there's thing there's, you know, use where like call to actions, right? Like now there's, now there's like social media posts and blog posts and, emails and email marketing and websites are such a big important part of our marketing portfolio now there's online directories there's so many different now touch points where we are using words to communicate to communicate what it is that we offer to as you said be an ambassador for the business that we have and the services that we have to offer and I love the work that you're doing and the support that you're offering to helpers and healers because we do not get taught these things. But, and this kind of touches on what you and I discussed in our last episode, we have the skills within us. It's just finding, because a lot of us come into this work because we are skilled at being able to connect through words, uh, through communication. And now it's just kind of translating that into you know, putting also our marketing business hat on and how can we use those skills to build a really intentional bridge between, you know, our, the person we're trying to reach and the things that we have to offer. And I am a huge fan of utilizing podcasting (laughs) as a way to build that bridge. Personally, if I'm staring at a blank screen and that cursor and I need to write like a blog post, gosh, even like social media captions, emails, that is a lot harder for me. I love the idea of having a mic, a person to share this conversation with that can also then reflect um my skills and my specialties and what it might be like to be in a room with me in conversation with me. I would so much rather do that than write something out. And so podcasting felt like a really natural step for me to do in my own business. Um, And I would love to hear more from you about how therapists can really be utilizing the podcast platform 
as a way to support their businesses. And whether that's um, starting a podcast themselves or not, I think today we're going to mainly be focusing on not just, you know, gosh, start your own podcast, but how can you actually be utilizing other people's podcasts as, as a great marketing tool for yourself? Um, so maybe let's start with why is this something that you started to become passionate about podcasts in particular? Sure. So when I think about what makes for really effective copy, so written communication, we're talking about moving away from this kind of glorified CV on your website or wherever it is that you're communicating and moving toward what we call conversational copy. So copy that sounds like two human beings having a conversation. A podcast episode is a conversation. And so already we're that much closer. Mm -hmm. Even the most effective written communication can't can't even approximate really all of the subtle nuances of mm -hmm. a live human interaction. And so especially when we're talking about, I mean, I believe podcasts are a wonderful platform for any health and wellness professional, but therapists especially. Like this is where we shine. And, mm -hmm. you know, there are some really practical, I know we can get into in a bit, like what makes therapists so uniquely awesome at as podcast guests. But as a platform, it really shortens that runway. It really helps bridge connection between the therapist and the therapy seeker in a very short time. Because Ideally, the conversation mm -hmm. is centered around a topic that's of central importance and relevance to that audience member, to that therapy seeker. And I truly think of it as only good. It's only beneficial to be um, a therapy seeker tuning into a podcast because if you think about it, you know, we, we have this picture of a funnel, right? And I know that can kick up kinds of like marketing fears for people, but think of it as an ice cream cone. Okay. So at the top, we've got all those touch points, all the different um, ways that people could engage with content. So whether that's a podcast episode or a blog post or what have you. And the majority of those people will not go on to work with you specifically, like for therapy. But guess what? They're going to come away with something valuable. They're going to come away with a different um, experience of our field, of healthcare more broadly. I mean, I, I just, when I think about that potential impact, I really, I, I think if you step back and say, even if none of them were to go on to work with me, which podcasting is a very effective way to drive very targeted referrals to your practice. So that's not a worry. But even if that weren't the case, I still think it's a worthwhile endeavor just for that. It's it's you literally have the mic and you can represent our field in a really affirming, supportive, valuable way. Mm. I, I want to affirm that experience. I have a whole um, album on my phone of screenshots that I've taken from folks. Just I, 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 this album serves as a reminder to me of why yes. I keep showing up because sometimes, especially on social media and the work that it goes into having my own podcast, sometimes I'm like, okay, why? Like I need to, I need to kind of reconnect with why I show up, and I can always go back and I can read these DMs, emails, messages of folks who shared. I never knew that this was a thing. Mm -hmm. And I just tune into this podcast episode or, um, you know, or listen to this IGTV episode or wa I've read this post or watch these stories. But a lot of it is podcast listeners sharing that I never knew this was a thing. And you put a name to it or you described an experience that I had been living behind closed doors with. And I took a step to get support and these a lot of these messages are so touching and so impactful um, and a lot of times it'll even end with i just wanted you to know that you are making an impact and this is somebody that i will never work with um, directly and will never be a client and and that's okay because gosh i don't have room to see everybody in right. my practice but this is somebody who is going now and working with somebody that is a good fit for them because they knew maybe even what to say in that initial email to this potential therapist of what it was that they were experiencing. Um, 
and they it's just that that is so meaningful and also from a business perspective that person might not work with me but maybe gosh a year from now they know somebody who lives in the state of california who's struggling with postpartum and they might say hey um you should listen to this podcast and that person might become a future client and so there are just so many ways that 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 having a podcast and having somebody tune in and take the time to listen to you be in conversation about something and to get to know your voice and to feel heard just by listening and tuning into a conversation to feel seen that that can also serve your business later on Um, whether it is with direct client referrals or indirect client referrals or gosh if you go on to diversify your income through offering workshops digital courses all of that's going to serve you gosh even if you have your own podcast and you know you take on sponsors and you get paid from those sponsors based on how many of you you know listens your podcast gets the all of these folks are are learning to trust you um, and to see you as a really valuable um, supportive human and resource and it's so, so true. gosh i just want to confirm everything that you just said. I love that. And you're absolutely right. Once we step back and think about all the different, I think of it as like sending up a signal and we can't know all the different directions or how far those ripples will go. We can't know. And so, um, yeah, I've been astounded by just all, all the fun stories and benefits that not just that I've experienced, but in talking with you and other folks as well. I love, I love this, this visual of ripples. That's really how um, I see it and I've experienced it myself. So you mentioned earlier that therapists make great podcast guests. Can you share a little bit more about why you think that is? Absolutely. I think there are, I think there are lots of different reasons and we can think about some of the really practical ones, right? Namely, we're quite comfortable with some pauses in a conversation. Not all humans are, not the case. And so being able to just keep company with someone in a relax, just be relaxed in someone else's presence, that's a major barrier for many people when they think about, if you think about business owners as a broad group, when they think about pitching themselves, like the thought of actually sitting on a call um, is, there's a lot of fear around filling the silences. We don't tend to struggle with that. We're quite... We're quite comfortable sitting in some silence or in just a natural pause and reflecting. And so that's one really practical reason. But I guess if I could distill it down to three of my favorites, the first is the E word, perhaps our greatest superpower, empathy. Empathy serves us from tip to tip when we think about the podcast guesting experience. So from the very first, um, the very first Uh, attempt to craft a pitch that's going to go out, having some empathy for the person who's going to be on the other end of that pitch, whether it's a host or a member of the host team, thinking about the audience and what the audience needs to hear, thinking about what is going to be in highest service to all of you, you as the guest, the host, uh, the audience, that is going to serve you well just right from the jump. But all the way through in your preparation Mm -hmm. for the podcast interview, once you're actually in the conversation like we are now, as well as afterwards, thinking ahead. I'm a big, big believer in thinking strategically. We don't want to do anything just to do it. Life is too precious and short. So if we bring some intention to the act of putting ourselves out there as a podcast guest, exercising some basic empathy about, okay, where do I want this to lead? If this is starting my dream client on a journey of some kind, like where do I want it to lead and how at every stage of the process can I facilitate that? So that's one that, you know, we tend to really discount empathy. It's like, yeah, yeah, empathy, of course. But it's such a superpower and it really makes us stand out. I know you have your own experiences as a host times two. I'd love to know kind of, can you tell when when there's empathy behind a pitch or an outreach that you get versus not? Oh, 100%. <laughs> I, I find, and, and the experience of then actually being in the interview, um, I, I, I will oftentimes even 
even joke behind closed doors, but now publicly, like I, it is so much easier to have a therapist on as a podcast guest than any other profession. And not to say that I haven't had amazing guests who were not therapists, who in their own, a lot of them are are helpers and healers in their own in their own right. And so there's so much, oh gosh, and and it's not it's it's the empathy, and then it's also the and this comes with empathy, but they're really listening. And so if I maybe share a part of my story and, and then share a question to follow that, to kind of bridge to, you know, the next part of the podcast episode, if it's a therapist and they're the guests, they're listening and they might connect a part of my story to their response. And it just weaves this beautiful web uh, that ends up becoming this episode that draws in the listener. And that what that means is that the listener is going to stay tuned in to the full episode. I've also, I, I also feel like therapists, like you mentioned, are, lis- are thinking about the listener. And so both myself and my guest, if it happens to be a therapist, will oftentimes say something like, you know, I'm thinking for the, the person who's listening and tuning in right now, this is the, this is the message that I want them to hear. Or I I wonder if this is something that a question that they might have that comes up right now. And now let's explore this question. So being able to kind of hold space for not just the person in front of you um, or that you're talking to, but also the other ears that might be tuning in. Just like we might, you know, if we're in the therapy room, not just be considering the person, the client in front of us, but the people that they go home to and the other relationships and imagining um, the whole system around this individual. And, and I think that we, we are trained and have that skill to be able to do that. And that definitely applies to the, the podcast episodes and conversations that I'm having with fellow therapists. So absolutely, can I confirm that that is something that I experience whenever I'm interviewing a, a, a therapist on my podcast? I'm so glad. And I, I love in thinking about kind of the next, the next point uh, I wanted to share, which is that w- therapists make excellent podcast guests because we're metaphor super generators. Like we don't even realize we're doing it. And it's totally related to empathy, right? You might not view yourself. I know you are, but not every therapist doesn't necessarily self-identify as a creative person, but there's such inherent creativity and flexibility in being able to pull an illustration or an example that will connect with with your audience member, with the person that you're speaking to on an episode. And that is absolutely a natural reflection and extension of what we do in the therapy room or on the therapy Zoom. Like we we do this without even realizing it and it makes for such rich and fruitful conversation on a podcast. And again, if we go back to the intention behind it, it doesn't just make for a great conversation. Hopefully those metaphors, we don't just do it to be snazzy. We're doing it to unlock something. It's like you're unlocking a new level or you're like switching on a little light bulb. Uh, Sorry, I'm in like video game mode from the past year and however long with our teenagers at home. But you're you're essentially trying to give the person on the other end of that episode an aha moment that is going to be personally meaningful and valuable to them in helping facilitate whatever they're working toward or working on or even just helping them exist um, in the present moment. And I, we do this so well, whereas other people have to really practice it. Oh my gosh, this, okay, I, I hadn't even considered this before, but this is... This is really a lot having, I'm having a light bulb moment where I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> when I, I just got out of a session with a client and in that session, the client was sharing something that I could really relate to on a personal level. And I've had clients, I've had other clients, you know, share similar, similar, similar experiences. And definitely there are moments where I will share, I'll, I'll self-disclose a story or an experience very intentionally. But for this particular client, I felt like what would be more powerful for her would be for me to share a metaphor so that she could see her own life experience through something that wasn't so direct as a, oh, I've experienced this similar thing and here's my story, but could begin to see herself through 
the metaphor, and that could then elicit um, other parts of her story to come forth, right? And when you're sharing, when you're when you're doing a podcast episode, you have no idea who's listening. And while many times I will share personal anecdotes or personal stories very intentionally and thoughtfully um, self-disclose um, some pieces of my own experience, what I'll often do and what I'll see that other therapists often do as well is share something, an experience through a metaphor. And what that allows for, as you're describing here, is for the listener, anyone, someone who we have no idea what the nuance of their story is or their context of their experience is, they can begin to see their own story through the metaphor and then it takes on a life of its own for them. And yeah, as therapists, we do have that unique skill to always be thinking in metaphors. It's, it plays such a huge role in so many of our interventions in the work that we do that it comes so much more naturally. And, I, and, and, it's, and it's funny, I'm actually right now going to do this where I think about the listener right now and thinking maybe the listener is like, oh, metaphors are actually really tricky and hard for me. I think we also may have just one idea of what a metaphor might be. Um, you know, I use a lot of acceptance and commitment therapy and there's a lot of like, there's literally a workbook for ACT that says like the great, all the metaphors you can use in ACT, you know, and they're very, um, uh, there's like a <laughs> script for them. And so I'm not talking about like that you need to have some elaborate metaphor that like is transformative. It, it, it could be so it could be something else. It could be so, so simple. Just you use the word ripples earlier. And the minute I heard ripples, I had an experience where I had a visual and ideas came to mind just from the visual of you using the word ripples earlier. And so this does not have to be your use of elaborate metaphors. This could be the way that you use words to describe an experience that somebody can connect to in their own way. Would you agree with that? I wholeheartedly. I, it's, again, going back to kind of any kind of copy, any kind of communication, we're never doing something just to do it. There always is an intention behind it. Um, and so when I think about metaphors, absolutely, we're not trying to write poetry here. There's no awards being given out for how elaborate. And in fact, I, I really would urge people to think very simple um, because usually that's what comes through with greater impact and resonance. When I think metaphor, I'm thinking really broadly. I mean, it. some of the, the greatest metaphor generators are, are children um, and, and adolescents. And so I think whether it... Um, yeah, to, to the person listening right now, if this is, if you have a young person in your life, whether or not you work with them professionally, I'm sure you've had the experience of just a slight different perspective they take on something, a word that they swap out, mm -hmm. maybe incorrectly, but that you t absolutely get the meaning. Being able to do that kind of a thing on a podcast episode, and you can pull judiciously from your own clinical experience, you can pull something out of thin air, but I have just found so much transformation. Um, and so many of those, the DMs that have landed in, in my inbox um, from folks who have tuned into episodes I've been a part of, often will name some of the the least elaborate things that I've shared, but they've landed in a way that's meaningful. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, a lot of times when I talk about um, my birth story and my experience with having a C-section, I use the words belly birth. And I've had so many DMs of folks sharing how transformative it was for them in their own relationship with the birth that they had, which was a technical C-section, um, but to just shift the language in calling it a belly birth, so much more tenderness that they felt both towards their experience and themselves. And I didn't come up with the word belly birth, um, but it's it's words that I use to describe my experience um, and with my guests when they've had one. And they might use the word C-section and I might, I might respond with, and so in your belly birth. And in just that, in just reflecting back to them that this, that what they experienced was still birth, right? Um, their baby just happened to come through the belly. And even when it's, it's, it's com more complex and it's complicated, it was birth. And just that sometimes I've had DMs about just those words, just those two words. And, and I, so I just want to 
confirm again <laughs> this experience of the use of words and the way that we as therapists are very intentional about the words that we're using can make us really great podcast guests and the impact that that can have with people who are tuning in, people that you don't even know. So are there, are there any other pieces here? Because I know that I think you said there's there's three or that you had a number. So I want to make sure that I'm giving you the time and space to, to finish up this piece before we go on to the next, because I want to hear, I want to, I want to, I'm so excited to dive in deeper to this. I totally appreciate it. And I just, by the way, it's not meant to be rigid. I, <laughs> yeah. I organize my own thoughts sometimes with bulleted lists, like, all right, Michaela, you got three things to share. Okay. <laughs> so the third that I wanted to highlight is that as therapists, we're not afraid of a little research. And if this is giving you hives going back to grad school, don't let it. I'm talking even the informal research we do just in day-to-day practice, right? We're always doing research on the population that we serve. And so by bringing that same kind of can-do spirit to our podcast outreach, um, pitching podcasts as a guest, we already are okay, it's not a race, right? But we already have such an advantage over many people who are um, starting with the pitch rather than first taking some time to reflect. And if someone is listening like 99% ready to just fire off their first pitch, it might be a little disheartening to think, oh, research. But really, and again, I'd love to hear your thoughts on the receiving end as a host, but there is a real difference between a pitch even a well-written one that has been sent off without first being grounded in some solid research Mm -hmm. versus one that has. And so I'm a tremendous advocate. Um, I talk about it quite a bit about that being a crucial first step. Um, So I'm not just talking about podcasts, like research on the specific podcast that you may be pitching, although that's a really important piece of it, but even beginning a few steps behind that and thinking, what is my end goal? Mm. Why am I doing podcast appearances? Am I am I wanting to drive more of the right people to my practice? That's a really worthwhile goal. Um, okay, so working backwards, where might those people be right now? Whose audiences are they already existing in? How can I reach them? And so it it prompts you to think through some important things if you haven't before, like, who are, who are my professional neighbors out there? Who are other people serving my same dream client, but maybe in a complementary or different way than I do? And then going a layer deeper and saying, okay, if I had that person's undivided attention, the member of that audience, what would I want them to know as it relates to the work that I do? Even just that, what I've just said, is more than many people do before they begin podcast outreach. Fair? Oh. <laughs> Absolutely. So fair. I probably get two to three podcast pitches a day lately, it feels like. And I, a lot of them, you can clearly tell, like, I mean, sometimes it's as bad as like, they're not even using my correct first name. <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> most often they do at least get that part. But you can just tell that they they, they don't know the audience that I'm serving. They don't know that I've already covered this topic maybe before. And even if I have, I would, I, I'm so much more inclined to explore deeper if this could be a potential guest, if they give me, if they acknowledge that, or they give me a specific part of this experience that they can speak to directly. And I wanna say for, for those who are listening, in terms of research, you could, I mean, there's so much that you already know. So part of the research can just be, what do I already know that I can bring to this person's audience? This doesn't mean that you need to become an expert on something new, right? Like this is like, you already know so much. And now you're researching, you're looking at who, who are they, who are their listeners? What do their, what, what are their listeners pain points? What have they already struggled with? What is something, if this is like, say, a podcast that you really, you you really are, um, uh, you admire the podcast hosts and you really are interested in connecting with them and, you know, maybe you have some imposter syndrome of, gosh, like, why, why would they be interested in having me on the podcast? I mean, 
own your stuff. Like, what is it that you bring to the table? Like research. I mean, and that's, that's all that's research to me, right? Is like really kind of connecting in with that piece. Totally. And, and then sharing that um, when you are pitching um, to this person. And, and I think part of the research could also be knowing what is this person really, this host really seem to be interested in, you know, what are some topics that really seem to be themes for them that they talk about on other platforms and that you could speak to more specifically from your expertise and you're bringing that to the table and, and then proceeding with that confidence. And knowing that imposter syndrome is going to come along for the ride anyway, because it does for all of us, we're humans. Gosh, I feel like an imposter, like in this conversation, I'm like, wait, am I really, do I really know enough about (laughs) podcasting, even though I have to, (laughs) like, I mean, you know, gosh, I, 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 even though you're doing the dang thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's just coming along for the ride. It's, it's a backseat passenger and um, coming along for the ride, but I get to keep moving forward, knowing that that part of me is, is just is just trying to make sure that I'm, that I am, you know, showing up and, and that I am doing research. And sometimes that can be motivating. I just don't want that part of me to get in the way. But yes, so I can definitely confirm again that that is definitely something that I can pick up on uh, when I am being pitched. And gosh, people are coming out of the woodwork these days. I don't, something's happening. Maybe, maybe, maybe it is my, my podcast is doing well, but I'm getting so many pitches. Uh, it's hard to keep up, but it's- I mean, you're fabulous. So there's that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. But um, one thing that I've, I've noticed is a lot of these pitches are not coming from the person directly. They're coming from like a PR agency or agencies now. And it's interesting- I find I actually am so much more interested in the pitches that come from the person directly, which I don't know what that means. Like, because I'm sure these people are paying these companies to reach out to potential podcasts for them. Um, But I find myself so much more inclined to read and respond to the ones that come directly from the person. So if somebody's listening, they don't need to hire somebody to do these pitches for them, correct? (laughs) Hey there, podcast listeners. Okay, before Dr. Michaela answers that question and we get more into some of the nitty gritty of what you actually need when it comes to recording a podcast as a guest, I want to quickly share that if you are tuning in around the time that this episode airs, September 28th, 2021, which is next week as of the launch of this episode, I am opening the doors to all of my therapist e-courses, the crafted practice, your roadmap to building a modern private practice, the established therapist toolkit, which is the toolkit for those of you who are already established and you just want to learn ways that you can diversify your income or expand your reach or really hone in your branding and really start to see your ideal client and my podcasting for therapist course. So if you are interested in actually starting your own podcast after listening to today's episode, then go to the link in the show notes to join the waitlist and be the first to hear when all of those courses open and you'll get to learn some of the fun and exciting and hopefully really helpful bonuses that come with this launch period. All right, you can head to the show notes to learn more. Let's get back to the episode. Yes, and I'm. You've already perfectly uh, touched on a few of the the most common myths that I hear as I'm talking with therapists about this idea of pitching themselves as a podcast guest. So one of them, right off the bat, I think it was well the most recent one. You said no, you do not need to hire any sort of team. This is one reason I love it. In addition to the fact that you alluded to this earlier, right? It's like it's just you and a microphone. It's just a conversation, like. Cassidy, you know, if we weren't doing video right now, I would be like over there with a fluffy blanket in my PJs. Like it is casual. Yes. And, you know, I mean, I'm happy, I'm happy to get dressed for you, friend. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like it's important for folks to remember this is 100% ripe for DIYing. I actually think this has, you know, as 
media appearances go, this has one of the lowest barriers to entry because truly you can do all of it yourself. And a lot of other myths that kind of hook into that one. No, you don't need fancy equipment. No, you don't need to clear your schedule to make this happen. Um, I think if folks are interested in doing podcast interviews, like as as a piece of their content marketing, I think it's worth building in some some habits into their schedule to create space for for sending pitches, but it certainly does not have to become another full-time job and it doesn't need to be in order to see some success with it. But I think the first myth that you touched on is that this idea that, oh, I'm, what do I have to offer? What do I bring to the table? And, you know, a lot of times, again, word nerd over here, like the terminology that, that we use when we talk about podcast pitching doesn't help us it really kind of does invite more imposter syndrome, right? We talk about pitching versus like sending an invitation um, or just basic outreach. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about landing the interview rather than mutually agreeing to connect on a call, right? That's really what it is. And I think that's why I really favor the term. I use it all the time, co-created content, because that's absolutely what it is. You are coming together to have this piece of content that even if you were to pitch the same topic, even if you were to um, speak on 12 different podcast episodes about the same topic, it would never be the same piece of content because it's like lightning in a bottle. It's that conversation between these two people. And for that reason, it's special and it's something that you have an active role in. So don't sell yourself short. You bring so much to the table by virtue of the fact that you are you and you have your experience and your expertise, yes, but you also have your own lived experience and your own special style that you bring to the conversation. Mm. Okay. I love, I love all of this. And I'm thinking about the listener right now as I'm wondering if they are wondering, okay, you said I don't need special equipment. Do I need a mic? Do I need a mic? Do they need a mic, Michaela? Like, do they need to go buy some, uh, uh, I use a Yeti mic. Do they need to go buy a Yeti mic right now on, on Amazon? Or is this something that they can just use their computer mic for and some earbuds? Like, do they need a mic? <laughs> to get started, no. I say no. Um, I love my Yeti mic. I know you love yours. It's very handy and it does work well in terms of I mean, I, I think there's all kinds of, if you're doing any kind of recording or any kind of calls for your practice, it's actually really handy to have an external mic of some kind. But what I really encourage people to think about is if, if the mic has become the barrier, don't let it be. You can get started with anything that you have. And so one thing, I have a, a resource that I created that I'm happy to share that is basically a super simple gear guide to for people that are going to be doing podcast guest appearances. And I like to give lots of different alternatives for folks. And one is, yes, just to use the earbuds that come with your phone. You probably have a phone. And um, that, that, does, that does the job. It can work really well. You know, when we think about this, we're not, no one's expecting like recording studio quality. Usually mm -hmm. um, there are some very highly produced podcasts out there, but when we think about as healers and helpers out there um, positioning ourselves as podcast guests, what we really want to think about is pulling away any distractions from the message. So the truth is not all mics are created equal. And so you might find that there's a funny little buzz or feedback when you work, use certain things. I know when I use earbuds, sometimes, sometimes I get feedback, sometimes I don't. Mm -hmm. So I think over time it makes sense to invest in like an external mic, like a Yeti, but truly that's about as fancy as it gets in my experience. Um, I have a very inexpensive set of headphones that I sometimes use if there's noise happening in my environment. But yeah, I mean, what do you think? Oh, I 100% agree. And, you know, I used to, in my little perf perfectionism likes to come along for the ride with me on all my projects as well. I used to obsess about the background noise and the chair squeak or my dog barking or the fire truck that drove by and like obsessively tried to edit those things out. And I've actually come to this space of knowing, of feeling like I actually think as a listener to me, I actually kind of, as long as I can like really hear the guest, 
I don't mind those little background noises. It actually makes me feel like I'm part of the conversation and I'm sitting there with them. So I just, you know, I try to remind my little inner perfectionist of those things uh, when, when she pops up. And, you know, what's interesting is I was a, a guest on a podcast once and this was a podcast that had a full on studio and I and they had this whole team that was uh, working with them behind the scenes. And that ended up being the most like low key recording. They did not like the, the mic wasn't working. And so they just had me actually call in on my phone and I recorded literally like I was talking to them on my phone. And so, you know, you, you do not need a mic to start off, but it could be a really great thing to invest in at some point. And you can get them on Amazon for between a hundred and $200 typically. And, uh, it can be a great thing that you might find yourself using quite often as I use my mic every day. So it's, it's definitely something at some point, but you don't need it to Same. start off. So Michaela, I would love to hear yeah. some of your insider tips to help you stand out as a dream guest to podcast hopes. Um, hosts and, and audiences. What are some of your insider tips here? So you've, you've beautifully anticipated and touched on some of them already. A lot of it comes down to really familiarizing yourself with, like, let's assume you've done the research of figuring out which are some really um, right fit podcasts for you to pitch. The next step is familiarizing yourself with the host and with that particular podcast. And I, again, am a fan of doing this thoughtfully and judiciously, not going down a rabbit hole. So you are not obligated to go back and listen to every episode ever recorded. Um, <laughs> I, I recommend going through and listening to um, a couple of recent episodes, if you're not a regular listener, that is. Um, a couple of recent episodes, uh, maybe a couple of the most popular episodes. You can usually find this information like on Apple Podcasts. Sometimes the actual host will put together kind of a best of list, like fan favorites, that kind of a thing. Listening to some of those and then going through and just scanning for relevant topics that are related to yours and listening to those. And what that's going to do, so really we're talking about maybe like a handful of episodes. And that's that's on the high end of what I recommend as far as preparation, listening preparation. What we're really getting at is kind of what's the basic structure and format of, of interviews on this podcast, because they're not all alike, right? Um, what's the style of the host? Are there particular questions that the host, like is it a more formal question and answer or is it more of a conversation? Does it seem to follow a certain... Um, format or arc, or is it kind of like everyone is different? Are there kind of idiosyncratic pet questions that the host likes to ask of every single guest? These are just really helpful things to know. And in the process, again, going back to empathy, it's also going to get, you're going to become conversant in that podcast so that Hopefully it will make your pitch more thoughtful, but definitely once you're actually on the interview, you can make thoughtful re references to past episodes. And, you know, we don't want to be overly mechanical about that, but what that does is it helps. I mean, it feels good to the host, right? It shows that you are an active participant of that podcast community. You're not just swooping in for your interview and then flying out of town. It's like you're there to stick around and engage. And it also is doing something that I don't hear talked about a lot with regard to podcasts, which is that as guests, there's a tendency to think about our episode as this standalone thing, right? I got to prepare for my podcast interview when really, hopefully, your conversation is one that there's kind of this golden thread connecting it to other conversations on the podcast. And maybe that thread runs through related topics that the host had in mind or a series maybe, or maybe it's a thread that runs through topics that are of relevance and special meaning to one particular audience member. We can't know for sure. Mm -hmm. But by, by situating our conversation in a context of other conversations, we help just communicate that this, this podcast is um, part of a greater whole. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that. And as a host myself, when a podcast guest has is able to make those connections, it's very meaningful for me. 
as somebody who puts a lot of time and energy and effort into my podcast and 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 does very, very there is a lot of intention in the topics that I choose to cover and oftentimes um, when I choose to release an episode and what episode came before it and there's a lot of an intention around these things and when somebody clearly notices some of these themes and can reflect that in the pitch and then in the actual conversation itself. Oh, that's going to be a very meaningful and memorable conversation for me. One that might even lead me to invite them back on the podcast, like it did with you, <laughs> Dr. Michaela. Yes. And so, yeah, <laughs> I, I think that taking, taking those little steps is, can be so, so fruitful and meaningful. And so as we're kind of wrapping up here, I would love to hear from you, what is a simple step that someone can take today to prep for their first or their next podcast pitch? I think if to the person who's listening to this right now, if they're thinking, right, I want to hit the ground running, one really, really fruitful first step is to do something that we referred to earlier in our conversation, which is reflect on if I could have my dream client's undivided attention for 30 minutes or more. And the, the reason I'm pulling that amount of time seemingly out of thin air is because podcast listeners as a whole, as a group, tend to be deep engagers with content. They're not just skimming through. They're not listening to a couple minutes of a podcast episode here. They tend to either skip around and be very devoted to a topic across different podcasts, or as I know you found in your communities through your podcasts, they tend to be deeply loyal to a particular host and a particular podcast. They tend to be true communities around that podcast. And so by reflecting, okay, if I could have that person's undivided attention, knowing that I probably will, what do I most want to communicate to them? What what misconceptions might I clear up for them? What potential barriers to whatever it is that they're working toward um, or struggling with? What barriers can I remove for them? How can I shorten or ease the path, bridge that gap between where they are right now and where they want to be? And again, thinking about yourself, possibly as a point of contact, you know, working with them therapeutically or in some other capacity at a later time, okay, what what do I want to say to them now to start them on a path toward that? Oh, I mean, I know you said it doesn't have to be poetry, Michaela, but anytime I talk to you, I feel like you are poetry. <laughs> you are so poetic, but I guess that's oh. why you do the work that you do. And I love that Part of your role is to is to support helpers and healers in learning the ways in which they can unleash <laughs> and discover the skills that are already within them so that they can become their own really effective marketing communicators and building those really beautiful intentional bridges um, for the people that they're trying to reach. And I'm just so grateful to know you and to have you as a part of my community and to be connected to you. Where can folks who are listening find you and the work that you're doing and all the beautiful resources that you are offering to the world? I think I think in the name of intentionality and simplicity, I will round up some resources that are related to what we've been talking about and kind of house them all at on one page of my site, if that's okay with you. So if yeah. listeners will head over to drmichaela.com slash Cassidy, I'll round up some resources to help you get started right away with the research, the planning, and then prepping for that first or next pitch. Oh my goodness. You are amazing. I will absolutely put that link directly in the show notes and This is so, gosh, I wish all my podcast guests could just create a landing page with all the resources. (laughs) You are, you are wonderful. Um, And Dr. Michaela, thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation and to come on the podcast again. So grateful to know you. You have a beautiful rest of your day. And I hope that anyone who's tuning in um, is able to connect with you and that the listener has a beautiful rest of their day as well. Thank you so much, Michaela. 